Thank you, Nandini. And uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, somebody has to use the data which is collected by the citizen science program. So uh, a good, good uh, effort at that. And we will, uh, there are lots of questions for you to take a look at the uh, Slack channel and answer to those in the in the specific thread for Paul. Uh, Naren, great to see you here. Good morning, Naren. And morning. Uh, welcome to the session. We are all set to have your talk today. And Naren is going to talk on a very interesting program, Citizen Science Project, and that is Angling for Conservation. Uh, Naren Srinivasan is a conservation biologist with formal training in wildlife biology and management. His research interests lie in freshwater ecology, although many, uh, although many of his early years have been spent in studying scorpions, snakes, and small mammals. Currently, he's a lead researcher for the Wildlife Association of South India engaged in bringing the iconic humpback Mahasir back from the brink of extinction. Naren and his friends built a 45 meter long, shiny metallic humpback Mahasir with, with scrap to draw attention on the need for its conservation. So that's a very inter interesting bit of information I found on you, Naren. So over to you. And uh, there will be a separate thread for questions for Naren. So kindly uh, put your questions on Narain uh, and do mark him at, at Narain so that uh, the questions go to him directly. Over to you, Narain. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Narain Srinivasan here, and welcome to this talk on a citizen science approach to monitor freshwater fish. Today, I will be presenting on behalf of the Wildlife Association of South India. They are a member-based organization with around 450 members and cumulatively around 50 years of the history on you know, managing freshwater uh, habitat. So their uh, model is <clears throat> largely built around these four pillars, of conservation, advocacy, research, and education. But today we'll be focusing, for the, for the purpose of the citizen science presentation, we'll be focusing on the research aspect which is largely targeted at Marcia, a species of fish that's been getting quite popular of late, and on monitoring wild fish stocks. <clears throat> so this is a quick snapshot of the citizen science project. Um, the idea was to collaborate and consult with scientists to manage um, or to inform some of the management recommendations that uh, the organization makes. And the second part was they wanted this program to be long term, of course. And hence, they built this uh, community of freshwater enthusiasts who, um, who, who work very hard to keep this project going. It's been running for about uh, eight years now. The, uh, the image on your right-hand side is a map of the Kaveri River Basin. So the blue line represents the Kaveri River flowing west to east. And all the yellow dots represent um, areas where we found uh, breeding populations of Marcia. Now, 20 to 25 years later, that those yellow dots would have been uh, dispersed a lot more through the basin. But today, we're, we, we found that these massive populations are located in basically two or three areas. And if you underlay a um, protected area map underneath this, you'll find that 90% of the populations are all inside protected areas. This, the second part of the, or the second aim of the project is to study long-term population trends in fish. So one thing good about working with Vasi and uh, when many angling associations or recreational fishing associations is that they love to maintain records. So this, we've got records from the Kaveri fishing camps for say around 50 years. And yes, at first sight, it looks like a mess, but once it's cleaned up, it starts to become a little more useful. So we've got information on date, time of every catch, length and weight, now, I've circled weight here because weight was possibly the least robust information we had. We couldn't be sure whether, you know, how people were measuring fish, how accurately it was be, uh, they were being measured. So we fixed this, and I'll talk about this a little later on. Another important character that was noticed, so this, this information that you're looking at is all with regard to Marcia, so one species of fish. But the fishermen did notice that there were two <clears throat> different categories, a silver moth and a golden moth. And this became very, this became crucial in, um, in, in, in actually identifying two different species amongst this population. Of course, there's information on location, the point where the fish were caught. So Rhino Point is a rock 
that gets exposed post October, November. So it's very, very accurate information. And we also have information on the angler and the name of the guide. So we can always go back and cross check information if need be. So here's a quick story about how, you know, these catch logs can be validated scientifically and used for, for, for uh, you know, understanding what is happening with the population. So this is a picture of a large humpback mass here. It is endemic to the Kaveri River system. It's the largest mass here of 16 mass species found globally and they are almost extinct, right? So these angler logs, these catch logs helped us put it uh, on, when, when I say us, it was a collaboration between a team from the UK and from India, uh, who put this species on as a critically endangered species under the IUCN Red List. So if you look at these graphs here, the, graphs on, the two graphs on top represent information of the humpback mass here, and the two graphs at the bottom for the blueprint mass here. And this separation of data would have only been possible if the information on morphotype was recorded by these anglers. That was crucial, that information. Now, if you look at the two graphs on the left-hand side, they represent catch per unit effort. So the number of fish caught per hour for that, for that particular year. And you notice that in 2004, <coughs> something drastic happened. So the, uh, there seems to be a huge population crash in the humpback mass here, and an apparent release of the uh, bluefin mass here population. And if you look at the weight information on your right hand side, this area marked in red, it's, it, it appears as though the entire size class has just been cropped out of that population. So the two graphs on top kind of <clears throat> indicate that the humpback mass here, there was a population crash in the humpback mass here, and subsequently there has not been a very strong recovery of the species. So we took this information and we set it up on a lake. Uh, it's the Malige Marahadala Lake in uh, Shiva Samudra. And we run a lot of training programs with our citizen scientists, with the local community as well. And it's been running as a fish monitoring uh, uh, project. So the first thing we needed to do, as I mentioned earlier, was to fix that weight uh, uh, category. So we went out with our citizen scientists again, and we, we caught around 300 fish, measured them as accurately as possible for length and weight. Luckily, they, they show an isometric growth pattern, so we could fix a, um, a linear function to this length-to-weight relationship. And that did two things for us. One is it increased the robustness of our weight information. So we, we no longer depend on different weighing scales to, to measure our fish. And the second thing it did was to reduce our handling time. Since it's a catch and release fishery, now there's no need to remove the fish out of the water to weigh it anymore. They can, they can be measured for length quite accurately, even underwater. So this is a quick snapshot of the sampling effort. I'm not going to go through the stats on the left-hand side, but if you look at the graphs on the right, there has been an, a steady increase in the amount of sampling effort, and over the years it's been quite uniform. There has been a dip in the monsoon months, you know, June to around September, October, but then it picks up after that. And we've been able to cover around 17 species using this method. So again, back to the mass here. This is information collected uh, across 14 years. And you see, you, you're clearly able to see trends in the population. And also, it, it matches what we saw earlier with you know, the bluefin massive population on a rise, uh, the numbers on a rise, and the weight categories, kind of the fish are getting uh, slightly smaller. These are some graphs from three native species. So I'm, I'm just going to focus on the graph at the bottom. So uh, that is for the snakehead. And what you see is a population crash here in 2014, or 2012 rather. And this is primarily because this, this fish is a really tasty fish and people love to eat them. So they take them out of the water, right? They're not releasing these fish. So we use this kind of information to go back to the organization and say, hey, you know, your, your snakehead populations are suffering. So would you consider not taking them out anymore or setting a bag limit on them? And uh, that, that's what's been done now. And hopefully by the next citizen science conference, we should be able to see a rise in that, uh, in those numbers again. Um, we're also able to track the populations of various invasive species. These are two species that are well known. Uh, so let, if you just focus on the black line, that's for the tilapia. Now the organization has, like I said, known about these invasive species and they've been removing them quite regularly. And this has led to um, from what appears to be uh, a control in the population. So it, it is, this the system becomes useful even in the management of invasive species. Again, I put up this slide uh, for translocated carps, and you'll see that these graphs are a lot more erratic, so there are a lot more peaks, and they're much closer, closer together. And this is because these fish are stocked in the thousands every year. So 
So you know you have a dip in the population, and they stopped, and then six months later you you, you start catching them, and they start showing up in the data again. Uh, we also know when Katla and Regal have been introduced in the system, say around 2012, in the graph below. Um, so it's it's this is crucial information for managing these freshwater systems. So what's next? So we need to set protocols for a reliable replicable model. Now that we know it works on this one lake, to take this model and replicate it in other areas. Uh, we plan to do this by tying uh, by uh, uh, tying up with angling outfitters in various areas in Maharashtra and uh, different states that have their own uh, angling association. We also want to set up a mobile app because we have a lot of people who go out fishing every day and um, they're also collecting information. So to streamline that information and get that into the system. And eventually we want to make this data available to uh, sustainable uh, management of freshwater fisheries by various uh, bodies. So uh, if you want to join us, there's a lot happening with Vasi. Uh, please write into friendsvasi at gmail.com. This is a quick, uh, this is a model of a humpback Vasi that we built uh, earlier this year, it's about 40 feet long and it's a walk through. Uh, so on the right hand side, you can see a picture of children uh, riding their bikes through it and you know, they get to interact with the content that we have displayed inside. We also have a lot of artists coming into the picture now and you know, coming up with these beautiful pieces of artwork. So if you're interested in joining us, please write into friends of us at gmail.com. You could be a scientist, you could be an artist, it could be anybody. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a quote that I think is quite relevant to this talk today. Um, it kind of captures the essence of what we're trying to do at Wasi. So please follow us on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for the organizers for putting this uh, conference together. I'm happy to take any questions. Hi. Thank you, Naren, for that great talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, there are a few questions for you. Um, so let me start mm -hmm. with the ones on top. Prabhakar asks, um, just curious to understand the Angular community in India. How big are they? And do they still keep records and share them with each other? Are the numbers of anglers increasing? So um, the Angular community, it's changing right now. So earlier, it used to be, you know, mainly the elite who went out angling. And that's primarily because, you know, a lot, a lot of the fishing tackle wasn't available. But now the market has changed. Uh, you know, Decathlon sells fishing tackle and there's been a huge boom in the number of anglers. So 100% there are way more people going out fishing. Uh, so, sorry, there was another bit to that question that I missed. Um, uh, do they still keep records and share them with each other? Yeah. So there are angling associations in practically every state in India. And these associates, some of them maintain records. So the Wildlife Association of South India is one of those organizations that have been doing it from 1972 as part of their own practice. But um, there are definitely associations that are maintaining cash records and it's, they're starting to do it more often now. Okay. And earlier this was for awards or, you know, prizes for catching the biggest fish and is-, is Not really, uh, to be honest, to be honest, it's just innate in the sport to just, you know, record your catch. So people are not recording only the trophy fish above, you know, 5 kg, 6 kg. They're even recording, you know, the number of 4 kg fish they're catching because they understand that, you know, the more number of uh, smaller fish you're catching, the higher the recruitment in that area. So there's a lot of direct connect with uh, anglers and, you know, uh, the, the ecosystem that they're working with. They're very interested in it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Arjun asks, uh, just curious, how are the clarius and tilapia removed? So this is, uh, it's a recreational fishery. So uh, essentially, I probably should have mentioned this, essentially what happens is that uh, people come to that lake to catch fish. And there are three or four standard, standardized methods in which they do that. One of them is bait fishing. So tilapia and uh, clarius, they uh, can be both easily caught in a method called using a spring feeder. So uh, that's how we catch them. And after that, they remove the, they, they they've eaten basically, they go straight on. Okay, okay. Um, and I had a question for you. Uh, you showed us some uh, statistics about fish numbers and sizes. Um, so does the fish size correlate with gender within either of these two <clears throat> kinds of machine? And is so one sex, uh, sorry, the second part. So is one sex more likely to get caught than the other due to some kind of behavioral differences or something like that? Is that why you're seeing such dark patterns? 
So that is that is quite uh, interesting. To be honest, we haven't been able to sex these fish because it's very hard to do so. Okay. And uh, the angling community has uh, not done that, to be honest. So uh, the information that we're looking at here doesn't separate for gender. Um, but what I have personally noticed with certain species, uh, say the like the uh, snakehead, for example, which is a, uh, which is a predatory species, they have a lot of they show a lot of parental care. So in those situations, you definitely see the males that during the breeding season, when they have their brood around them, they're a lot more aggressive and they end up getting caught a lot more. So okay. that, that's just a personal observation. With, um, I see. It doesn't show up in this data. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so we don't have any more questions right now, but they are coming in slowly. So please uh, you know, sure. stay on chat uh, with Slack. Um, and uh, oh, there's one more here. Does angling injure fish or cause infections? And how long does the mushy stay alive out of water? So um, we haven't noticed any infections that have come out because of angling. Uh, okay. We've actually done a few studies to see this the post-release uh, survival, and it's quite high with uh, regard to Marcia. Uh, there's some formal publications on that that I can share later. Um, uh, they will stay alive outside water for maybe five minutes, but every second that they're outside water, there is an impact on them. So we've, we've created these angling best practices that are honed on like 30 years of experience. And our um, one of the things that we do is if you're taking a photograph of a fish, there has to be a drop of water falling from the fish. And that you know ensures that uh, anglers are not air exposing these uh, fish too much. So we try and control it. We try and uh, modify our best practices every year. OK. And Farida has a question. Um, she's yeah. curious to know, um, after angling, are the fish left back in the river? So yes, um, most okay. fish are, are. So um, our natives, Sorry, we encourage all English. anglers. That was a question Sorry. from Nishad. OK. Not, not for uh, so, yeah. so we encourage all our anglers to release our native fish species. Because see, the thing is, in India, nobody knows anything about fish. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a new thing. So we recommend to release of native fish. But fish that are stocked, such as the Rohu Katla, there are five fish in Karnataka, they call them government menu, you know, it's like that. So they stocked in the thousand. So those fish we allow people to take out. So if you take the Masya, for example, it's socially imposed. People do not take out Masya at all in, from the okay. angling community. Okay. There's a pride in releasing these fish. Okay. We have one last question. If we could just do it really quickly before we move on um, to the next speaker. Sure. Um, Arjun Kamdar has a question, and it's a slightly complicated question, but I think the gist of it is, has Wasi looked at whether individuals once caught are less likely to be caught again? So is there some kind of trap shy behavior? We haven't done anything formally on that front, but uh, we have tested. There, there are a lot of anecdotal reports of people catching, recatching fish, you know, as soon as the next day. So we've done uh, some studies on how multiple recaptures affect these fish. But uh, we've also tried mark recapture, but we haven't really recaught these fish because the lake that we're working on is not a closed system. It's actually connected to the Bangalore water supply. So okay. fish are moving in and out of the main river. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Naren. Uh, Farida, Thank back you. to you.